The parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the elder son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because it has him back safe and sound. The elder brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and his found. Hello everybody, my name is Emma and for those of you who don't know me, I'm the children's pastor here so usually you'll see me dancing on stage, having a great time in the morning um, but it's so great to see all of you here tonight and you might have seen on social media, tonight's title is called The Great Welcome. So first of all, I just want to say welcome, no matter who you are, whether it's your first time here tonight, whether you come every week, no matter what your view on faith is, I really believe that the Father, God, he already knew that you personally would be here tonight. And he wants to say to you personally that you are so, so welcome. So can I pray before I start? Let's pray all together. Lord God, we thank you that you are already in control of tonight. You are already working. You already see us. You already know us. And you already welcome us. And God, we just pray tonight you would be speaking through your Holy Spirit to each of us individually. Lord, give us what we need. And we just pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So as Rosie said, this new series is called Pilgrims and Prodigals. So first of all, I thought it'd be helpful to kind of define what these two are. So a pilgrim is usually a person that's journeying closer towards God. And a prodigal is usually someone that's kind of wandered far away from God. Now, Tim Keller describes a prodigal as recklessly extravagant, a person who has spent everything. And the reason why Jesus is telling the story is that he's actually not telling the story just to the lost people, to the prodigals. He's actually telling the story to the really religious people at the time, the Pharisees, the, the Jewish law keepers. And the reason why he's telling them this story is to show his heart for the lost to show how he cares about the people who have wandered far away from him. And also to show these religious people that their heart might not be 
in the right place themselves. Now, when we look at this parable tonight, we see it's called the lost son. But really, when we see the two sons, we see that both of them were lost for different reasons. Because the youngest son, he was lost and distant from the father externally. He was physically far away from God. But we see that the eldest son in the story was also far away from God because he was far away from God, not in proximity, he was right there, but he was far away from God in his heart. And in this story, when we talk about the father, the father represents God. And when we look at the sons, we can see maybe ourselves in the younger son or the elder son. And this is what Jesus wants to reveal to us tonight. So we're gonna be looking at, first of all, why did these two sons both become distant from the father? This father seems so loving, so caring, so welcoming. Why on earth did they become distant from him in the first place? What stops them from coming back to him maybe? And then we're gonna look at what the response from the father is tonight. So first of all, for this younger son, why was he distant from God? Well, we see in one of the first verses that he wanted to do things his own way. And if we look at verse 12, it says, the younger one, the younger son, said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now, one thing to note here is that in Jesus' time, the inheritance was normally given to a son when the father died. So by the younger sons going to his father while he's still alive and saying, I want my inheritance now, it was basically him saying to his father, I wish you were dead. And that would have been one of the greatest dishonors a son could say to his father in that time. But we see that he didn't want to honor his family, to do things the way things were done. He wanted to do things his own way. And I wonder how we can sometimes do that ourselves as well. It might not be that big, but it might be in the little things where we know what God wants, but we think, actually, God, I don't want to do things your way. I want to do things my own way. I think my idea looks a bit better. But when we do that, that's actually what the Bible calls sin. And sin, it, it's a three-letter word, and all sin is is putting I in the center, putting yourself, me, myself, and I in the center of your life, thinking my idea is the best, my way is the best. I don't want to listen to God. And um, C.S. Lewis, he, he wrote a book called Screw Tape Letters. And he, um, he speaks about how the enemy tries to distance people from God. He says, the simplest way to prevent people from being with God is to turn their gaze away from him and uh, turn the gaze towards themselves. And so I wonder tonight what it is that turns our gaze away from God. What's the things that distract us from God or what are the ways we want to go that we know God doesn't want us to go? And we see for the younger son, for him, it was the enticing ways of the world that caused him to turn his gaze away from the father. If we look at verse 13, the, the verse says, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and he set off for a distant country and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because... So often we can look at the things God has created and think, I want that, rather than looking to God himself. Now, as part of my job, I run like a key stage two connect group after school on a Thursday. And we had a really profound moment for one of the seven-year-olds a few weeks ago. Um, and we were talking about idols and that idols are things that we put above God and worship above God. And I was kind of saying to them, what kind of things might be idols for us? You know, money, power. And I was like, am I going too deep for these guys? They're like seven years old. But anyway, I, was, I kept going. And then one of the boys just put his hand up and said, Miss, I don't understand why people worship the things that God created. 
when we should be worshiping God because he's the one who created them. He is the creator. And I was like, you know what? This seven-year-old boy has absolutely understood what it means not to go your own way, but to go God's way, not to put ourselves first, but to put God first. And I think that's just such a great reminder to us. But I wonder where it is that actually we want God's things more than we want God. But we see that what happens to us, what happened to the son when we do do that. If we look at verse 14, it said, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. Now this is the trick of the world. It entices us. And we run towards it and we run away from the Father. And yet when we get to it, it's like a mirage. The enemy basically is trying to make us go somewhere that's not gonna be life-giving, that's gonna end up leaving us hungry, leaving us in poverty, leaving us in a famine like this younger son was. And I remember when I first went to church, um, I was at uni and I wasn't a Christian at this point, but I remember this talk that a vicar gave and it stuck with me and things don't usually stick with me, so it must be pretty good. And it was um, at a carol concert and this vicar was talking about how in life we're always kind of like chasing the next thing. The grass is always greener and there's always like a hole in our hearts that we're trying to fill. And I remember him saying that This hole in our hearts is actually in the shape of God. It's a God-shaped hole. And he said that nothing that we chase will fill that. And that is the trick of the enemy. He makes us, he takes us on this rat race, chasing, 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 trying to fill. But everything that we chase in the world will leave us hungry. Just like the son in this story was left in famine and he was starving And he was hungry too. And so we see from the younger son that he wanted to put himself first and that the things of the world became more enticing than God himself. But then we look at the elder son. What was it with him that made him distant from God? Well, we see it wasn't him rebelling. It wasn't him running away physically. The thing that distanced him from God was actually trying to be too good. You might think, what? Wait, wait a second. How how does this work? I thought we were meant to be good. Well, actually, this elder son, he had the similar heart posture to his brother because he wasn't being good because he loved his father and wanted to be close to his father. He was being good because he wanted to get things from his father. You know, he thought, you know, if I'm really good, if I show up, if I do my way, if I do my work, then maybe the father will give me more of the inheritance or maybe I'll get more money or maybe I'll get more status. And it was all about him, 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 I, I, I. He too was putting himself at the center of everything. And I wonder, that's a bit of a challenge for us tonight. I wonder where we do things that are good, but actually our motives are in the wrong place. Are we doing these things simply because We love God so much and we've been received so much from him. It's an overflow from us. And we give away freely because he's so freely given to us. Or does it come from a place of, well, I'll serve, you know, if I get recognition for it. Or I'll tithe, but God, you best best bless me for that. Or, you know, I'll, I'll show up for that friend again, but God, like, please, like, I want something from this. I wonder how often our motives are similar to the elder brother in this passage. But being a child of God isn't about what we can get from God. It's about what he's already given to us. And he has given us the best gift of all, which is life with him in all of its fullness because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. So we've looked at these things that have made the sons distant from God And now it's time to look at what decision they make. What decision do they make after they've realized that they are far from God? They're in the pigsty of life. They've made a mess. What do they do? What decision do they make? 
Well, let's look at the younger son first. Look at, let's look at verse 17. It said, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Now what I love about this is that he actually became a pilgrim in that moment. He went from being a prodigal who was far from God to being a pilgrim because he had turned from his old ways. He's turned from his own ways and he's decided to change direction. And I think a misconception we have when we think about coming to God is that we've got to have it all sorted. You know, we can't come to God unless we've completely figured it all out. Uh, we're the best versions of ourselves we can be and, you know, we've got everything We've got everything in store. But actually, that's not what happens here. That's not what happens for this younger son. You see, he turns to God in the brokenness, in the mess, in his shame, in his guilt, in his filth. He turns back to the father. And the father, he doesn't care about the dirt. He just cares what direction he is facing. And so tonight for you, if you're thinking, gosh, I need to sort myself out before I come to God, that's not the case at all. You can come to God exactly as you are. All you need to do is turn. And turning in the Bible is called repenting. That's what it means, just turning from your ways to God's ways. And that's what this younger son did here in this passage. But can you imagine how scared the younger son is to return to the father? Because he has dishonored him so much. You know, can you imagine what he might be thinking? And that's sometimes how we feel about God. We think, oh, do I really want to come back to God after what I've done? Gosh, God's gonna be tutting, wagging his finger at me. Does God even want me back? But we see here the father's response to the son. And this is what God's response to us always is. If we look at verse 20, it says, but while he, the son, was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. You see, the father He hadn't been angry. He was in agony. He was longing for his son to come home. And he was waiting, desperately searching for him on the horizon. And what the youngest son believed was a lie, that this father was gonna be angry, he wasn't. And how often for us do we not come back to God because we think, oh, I've just disappointed him again. That's not how God sees us. God is a God who runs towards us. And in those days, a grown man running would have been really shameful and embarrassing. But what Jesus is trying to show us here is that as that father, he lifts his tunic up and he shows his legs like a little boy and he runs towards his son, as he takes on that shame, he's showing us that actually Jesus takes on our shame. And where the younger son should have felt shame, the father took it on himself. And that's exactly what Jesus does for us on the cross. When he went to the cross to die, the shame that we should feel for our sin, he takes that instead. And we are set free. We are set free from all the expectations, all the shame, all the guilt that we feel is taken away. And this father, he runs to him and he says, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. 
know what's so beautiful about this is that so often we can come to God thinking we need to earn his love. We need to pay him back for all the wrong things we've done. And that's what the younger son thought as well. The younger son thought as well. He thought, you know what, I can't come to God empty handed. I'm gonna come back to God and say, I'll earn my way back. Don't, don't call me a son, I'll be a slave. And all the inheritance I took, I'll, I'll, earn, I'll earn it back, I'll pay it back. But this is not what God does. The father says to him, no, here's your ring. Here's your signet ring, the family ring. You are back in this family. You don't have to earn your way back. I'm gonna give you your identity as my son back for free. And that is grace. Grace is a free gift that we don't deserve. And yet God lavishly pours it on us. He lavishly gives us more than we could ever imagine. And why? Why does he do this? Well, verse 24 says, because the father realized this son of mine, he was dead and now is alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. So they began to celebrate and this is what Jesus gives us as well. I think for some of us tonight, we think there's no hope for me. I failed. My end is written. You know, there's no hope for me coming back to the Father. And if that's you tonight, I just want you to know that is a complete lie. There is nothing you can do that is so bad that the Father will not accept you. There is nothing you can do where the Father will not open his arms up and welcome you home. And that is exactly what Jesus did on the cross. You see, he opened his arms up. And by doing that, he welcomed all who believe in him into God's kingdom, into his eternal family. He gave him that signet ring, that identity as a daughter and son of God. And just as the father ran to the son and opened his arms up wide, that's what the love of the father wants to say to us tonight. He wants to say to us, I love you. I want you just as you are. And I want to welcome you, my son and my daughter. And there's an image from Charlie Maxey, who's a, an artist who kind of made this sculpture of the father holding the son in his arms, welcoming him home. And for me personally, I feel like I've had a couple of these prodigal pilgrim moments myself. First of all, coming to faith in the first place. Um, but second of all, actually, um, a story of mine is that after I'd become a Christian, I remember I was still so new to faith and figuring things out. And I'd kind of gone on this pilgrim journey, this repentance, this turn from being a prodigal, being separate from God. I'd met with Jesus, I'd turned to him and I was kind of on this journey. It was a bit messy, it wasn't perfect, I was still figuring things out. And while I was on this journey, I remember I had um, this period where I really began to mess up again. I really turned from the Father even though I knew he was real, even though I knew he was there, even though I knew he loved me and saved me, the things of the world had enticed me again. The sin of putting my way first had captured me again. And I remember I fell into my old ways again. You know, I went out, I got way too drunk. I kissed people on nights out that I shouldn't have done. And I remember I felt so much shame and I just thought to myself, what, what am I doing? I'm in this pigsty. I felt like that younger son who had got himself into that rut and he was there feeling empty, feeling alone, feeling ashamed. And I thought to myself, how can I go back now? I feel so ashamed. And the lie the enemy would want us to believe is that we can't go back. That's the end. But like we said, it's not the end. And I remember coming to church after that summer and feeling like I've got to turn back to God again. 
And it reminds me of that song we sang just before. I run to the Father again and again and again. And sometimes our journey of faith, our pilgrimage journey, it's not a straight road. But God wants you to know that you can run to him again and again and again. And his grace is so big that he'll forgive you again and again and again. And I remember I came here to the service by myself, feeling like I need to turn to the Father again and feeling so much guilt and shame. And I remember after the service, I came forward for prayer ministry and I actually stood here with Rosie. And the reason why I wore this dress tonight is because I wore this dress on that day that I came back to church. And I remember just bawling my eyes out and saying to God, I am so sorry for where I've turned from you. It wasn't worth it. I'm so empty. God, I want you. I want you again. Please take me back. And I just felt the Father's love fill me. I felt the Father's heart welcome me home. And I knew, gosh, I've been far from you, God, but yet you're so kind. You are so loving. You are so forgiving. And Jesus, what he did on the cross, it made a way for us to be forgiven again and again. It made a way for us to be welcomed into God's arms. And yes, we're not perfect. Yes, we'll make mistakes, but we can choose to be pilgrims. We can choose to be facing the right direction and to let God lead us, to let the Holy Spirit guide us. And we know that when we make a mistake, we're never too far from him. He'll forgive us. He'll love us and he will welcome us. And um, we see these two sons, they, they both have their prodigal moments, but then they have to make a decision. And it's interesting because they, they both make slightly different decisions. We see um, the, young, the elder son, he finds it a bit more tricky to come to the father. The older brother in verse 28, he says, he, um, he refuses to go into this party. And so his father, if we read from verse 28, his father went out and pleaded with him. And it's interesting here again that when we're far away from God, he comes to us. It would have been seen as again shameful for the host of a party to leave a party. And yet the father once again takes the shame that the son should have on himself like Jesus does for us. And the son answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. You can see how many eyes and me's are in that sentence. You see, what was different about the younger son, the older son, is that the older son he was still thinking about himself. He was still putting himself first. And the thing that was dangerous about him being so good was that because the things didn't happen the way he wanted them to, he became bitter with the father. He became resentful of the father. But actually, a relationship with God shouldn't be about what we can get from him. It's about what he's already given us. And that's just not what the elder brother understood. But look at the father's response in verse 31. He says, my son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours, he was dead. And now he is alive again. And it's interesting that in this parable, we never see what the decision was for this elder brother. We never see whether he decided to turn from his prodigal heart and to turn back to the father. We never see whether he decides to enter the party again, whether he decides to turn back to the father. And my plea to you tonight is not to leave it open-ended, not to leave that decision open-ended. Please make a decision. Do you want to be a person who can turn back to the Father, receive his grace, fall into his arms, know his welcome, 
because he is there and he loves you and he wants to welcome you tonight, no matter who you are, what your past has been, what your mistakes have been, it's never too late. So, shall we stand as we pray? And let's welcome the band up. Yeah, as I was um, preparing for this talk, I went to a worship event and the worship singer um, broke out of the song as she just kept repeating, almost shouting, it's time to come home, it's time to come home, it's time to come home. And it really just um, penetrated my heart and I really felt like God wanted me to say that to you guys tonight. But actually, it's time to make that decision what you've been putting off because of any shame or any guilt or anything that's been distracting you from the world, that now is the time. Now is the time to come home, to be welcomed into the Father's arms, to be welcomed back home to God who made us, who created us, who loved us, who made a way for us to be with him. And so whether you're that person who's maybe feeling like, can I really be forgiven? Am I really worthy of forgiveness? The answer is yes. And tonight could be the opportunity that I did a few years ago where I came to the front, I received prayer and received the Father's love and decided to turn back to him. And if that's you, I would love to encourage you to come, come to the Father. Come, come fall into his arms because he's there to welcome you. And if maybe... Tonight's highlight of some things for you. Maybe you felt a little bit more like the elder brother. Maybe you felt like, actually, there are some things where I feel like my motives aren't in the right place. Actually, I do want to come back to the Father. I want to make that decision that the elder brother might not have made. And I want to turn away from my own ways and trying to control things, trying to be the savior of my own life. And I want to surrender to God afresh tonight. If that is you, can I encourage you that there's, there's no better time than now to come and receive prayer, to spend time with God and to know his welcome in your life.